Hello everyone, today we talk about the Ardenn Offensive, better known as the Battle of the Bulge or Battle of the Ardenn, depending on uh, which historiographical or national background you uh, name it from. It's just an overview. As you know, I don't make often at least World War II or just generally speaking contemporary warfare uh, content, but Schwerpunkt's plan is of course the one of expanding uh, in this field and to thicken the net over time. Of course, um, today's video is just a, a general overview on the battle per se, because there are major political uh, implications uh, in this in this battle and ne never having made uh, a video about, in fact, World War II in, in, in general, right, from a political point of view, let's say, from a manualistic point of view. Um, also, the appreciation of the strategic background would, would deserve a bit of a broader look at the thing for not talking about the single battles like I don't know the, the one of the Elzenborn Ridge of Bastogne of Sandvit etc that would deserve in fact also some videos uh, on their own um, in any case you know I I try it it's just uh, the time same time of the year almost which the the battle began and uh, I think it's a thought-provoking topic uh, in general from a sort of a strictly military point of view so we're looking as you know uh, as a very famous uh, battle the last major uh, uh, Nazi offensive on the Western Front after this the Germans would keep uh, retreating let's say for for the sake of simplicity let's talk about the Allies uh, meant as the Western ones, the, the Soviets, of course, but also the Russians, and in this sense, Nazi Germany, um, plus also, as you know, uh, other foreign contingents and elements still as the Germans. Um, and uh, the, the battle, as you know, was overwhelmingly fought by the US and the German troops. There is a British, um, an important British contribution, but numerically we're speaking something like 1 to 30 to 40 compared to, to the Americans. Uh, on the Allied side, there are all the controversies naturally regarding the, essentially, um, let's not call it enmity, but surely they didn't like very much each other between Eisenhower and Montgomery. Uh, in the first case, I just say, you know, very banally, but with macroscopic evidence, we're talking about the greatest commander in, in 20th century warfare, um, and we will see a little bit also strategically, but always remembering the Clausewitzian paradigm, you know, politically, why this um, competition, conflict existed, and why, in fact, Hitler wanted to exploit it, because this was the the ultimate goal of the Ardennes offense. Um, and sandwiched between the Allies to the West and the Soviets to the East, in 1944, the Führer launches a, an attack to retake France. Right, this is the essential objective. Was first of all actually to, to seize the 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 port of Antwerp, that uh, was crucial for uh, the Allies' logistics. That was starting to be pretty strained because basically they were still using the Normandy ports, uh, the only deep water one was the one in Cherbourg, and uh, the advance against uh, the, the, the Axis, of course, at this point, essentially just uh, the, the Allies had, uh, were fighting for, for Northern Italy, they, they were, uh, they had arrived basically almost to the Siegfried line, um, and uh, so on, on the Rhine, and that's also why this this battle was so significant, even though it was not a defensive one, but in fact a, a, a Nazi offensive. Still, the concept of the Wacht am Rhein was, you know, fueling, as we'll see now, the properly all the mystics of uh, German internationalism, of national socialism, uh, and and further. Um, and so the, the the core decision was uh, from Hitler to deploy um, his best armies, but. Uh, on the longer run, huge spoiler for those who haven't, uh, you know, followed the highlights, uh, due to the lack of means uh, and American tenacity, right? He, the, the the Nazi enterprise was was frustrated, ultimately. Now, 
in the summer months following the Normandy landings on June the 6th, 1944, uh, the Allied divisions in France had overwhelmed fundamentally any German attempt at resistance. I mean, the Germans had been overwhelmed. Um, up to that point, also properly, the, the occupation forces since the, 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 the capture of France had basically just spent vacation <laughs> there, but haven't been doing anything. The overwhelming um, Nazi fort was on the Eastern Front. Of course, it was a Mediterranean one, but uh, the, you know, just as you know, by sheer numbers, the East was the, the, the largest one. Um, and um, as you know, Operation Overlord was, uh, uh, you know, divine success. I mean, there is, you know, it could fail just by a different, uh, you know, a few or, or more or less centimeters in the tide. And that's how much uh, they had to risk. Uh, and of course, uh, things would have gone dramatically different if, say, the Western um, landings had not succeeded in so many ways. And in fact, the Battle of the Ardennes shows this Nazi hail strike that was directed, as we'll see now, essentially at breaking the entire uh, Western Front right, in, from the Allied side. Now, you know, uh, throughout all this, that there was um, a much broader pressure that, in fact, was the one posed um, by the East. Um, Consider that um, the, in August alone, the Wehrmacht altogether had suffered half a million casualties and had been forced to retreat um, across the entire Western Front. And as you know, the Operation Bagration had been uh, carried out by the Soviets, so this enormous also um, land operation in parallel to Overlord, the um, eastern uh, border was becoming ever closer to uh, Berlin, right? So this was evidently uh, a desperate situation since 1943, you know, the, the, the Nazis had understood at large that the war was, was over, but of course the regime per se had insisted in its own purpose and there was still in fact um, a great amount up, up to that point of men and material available at least for inflicting important losses to, to an enemy but an enemy that fundamentally was gaining superiority um, and had already gained actually as a matter of fact superiority on all fronts at this point in, a, in what appeared like a, a, just a the size of way in fact uh, this was the concept of total war right resisting to the um, to the very end but mobilizing essentially everything that um, had been um, uh, had w was available in in including the, the German population like and until um, until 1942 the the Nazi economy was in Germany was, was not uh, a war one Right. This is interesting because it shows, of course, how much you know important the support of the people is. Right, and there is nothing more stupid than saying that you know these people were just fighting for their own country, or that they were also good people. Right, what what was happening is, of course, the responsibility of the entire country as such. But of course, the grave cultural inferiority of the nationalistic and the socialistic regimes has still not been healed by anyone on the contrary we have essentially kept in inflating it making the fourth estate believing that essentially a normal uh, and the average person is a good person uh, because otherwise you know they, they can't uh, you know they would feel too threatened and burdened by responsibility and morals and science and so uh, the the point now is that now there are all these great heroes fighting for for their countries you know I mean and I can hardly find the words uh, to describe Nazi Germany in the Soviet Union, if not as some of the greatest abomination of the dignity of mankind in, in the deepest cultural veins. And this concept, unfortunately, is alien to most people because, again, most people fundamentally have the same brain mold of a nationalist socialist regime. I always remember this, that also the Soviet Union was a nationalist socialist regime. People still think that colors, flags mean anything in a strictly traditional civilizational uh, motive. So we should actually also celebrate that this, you know, monstrous realities massacred each other if it wasn't for the fact that of also 
a lot of crimes in the process were caused. But don't think in that sense that a civilian that is, uh, I don't know, uh, hit by a bomb is necessarily more morally worth than, uh, than just their perpetrators. It doesn't mean much. This depends on the person, it depends on the country, it depends on the culture, uh, it depends on the people. It doesn't depend on just the crime per se that eventually just uh, makes these people heroes. Unfortunately, again, this is, seems to be the disease of the third millennium. I mean, the fact that we let uh, children, you know, properly being raised in this utter cultural ignorance and inexistence. But what what can you do, right? If if parents have substantially seen their own parents denying uh, the Holocaust, denying the fact that it was carried out extens extensively by the, an entire country with the the entire extermination purpose, if they have uh, believed that uh, the, the, in the uh, clean Wehrmacht myth and all this bullshit that, you know, can be, let's say, this is not just uh, like every, th there is such a magnitudinal scale of the evidence of the documents of the, to me, I don't know, I was raised just knowing this as common fact because you can find it well described by all sides and the same perpetrators and not even trying to make a point that the Soviets were any better. You know, what you can see is, of course, uh, from an ideological point of view, disturbing and even, you know, that there were, of course, you know, different degrees of responsibility in um, those perpetrated this or not, that the means were terrifying, the, uh, the consequences were unspeakable. But, you know, to me, it's just also people who died um, out of you know, evil, but still, you know, suffering the same way they were essentially starved to death or deported uh, in Siberia or repressed in the most terrifying ways, just uh, like it was happening in the Soviet Union. It was happening in many other places in the world, and it would keep happening uh, with the extermination of hundreds of millions of people throughout all the second half of the 20th century without anyone seemingly giving a damn about it. Right. And, uh, you know, things like national socialism, like fascism, like communism are the reason why every single human being should wake up in the morning looking at the mirror and feeling disgusted of themselves. Right. Uh, because it, it, there is hardly uh, any, you know, any shield here that you can use uh, just by saying also uh, th this this is just, you know, someone. Right. The, the normal trial. So it's often celebrated because it says, you know, uh, at least they punished those Germans and say the same country uh, jailed 30,000 people, etc. But it, it's nothing compared to, of course, what Nazism did. Uh, it doesn't matter that millions of Germans died. Uh, they searched for it in the uh, fully, uh, most openly and responsible, directly responsible way. Uh, it's properly... The, the most disturbing thing about that is the is the fact that the the anti-traditional essence of these regimes has been mistaken after the war as a sort of traditional reality right and this again because the same fort estaters that made these regimes happening still were catalysts and collectivists something that basically was created on the ashes and the corpses of the ancien regime. And nobody points this out. So the Battle of the Ardennes in this regard should not be seen as the, ah, uh, you know, how, look at how uh, heroic, the, 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 the rhetoric of the lost cause. Uh, these people were so brave, they were defending their country. Yeah, I guess they were defending their country by wanting to invade the world and exterminating basically all those that didn't look like them. So I guess, you know, yeah, that's that's how you defend your country practically, right? It's a bit just like saying, like, Russians are fighting for their own country um, and, and they're not just a bunch of culturally underdeveloped people under a, a disgusting, uh, you know, abomination of mankind that their country supports. Uh, but uh, nobody really tend to point this out. Um, and m moral superiority does. Right, you know, when uh, you look at the Elsenborn Ridge and you look at one American casualty per 90 German casualties, 
uh, you really see incarnated the cultural, moral, and personal inferiority of a people, right? And that's exactly the price that in tradition is paid by the inferiors. This is the entire Na Norse mythology. This is the entire um, Germanic epos. This is, in fact, what the Nazis believed themselves, what the fascists believed themselves, that war was the ultimate proof of their, their superiority. And they lost in one of the most uh, unappealable and, and you know, uh, complete ways in the history of mankind, which is, I think, speaking just uh, for itself, right, according to their own rhetoric. So when we look at how they had gone there reflected this is what the nazis believed right they could be brainwashed by propaganda they could um let's say of course be unaware in their paranoia of what was was happening outside just like the soviets like these were people who probably didn't know what reality was outside at once they wanted to be indoctrinated in because uh, all these regimes were in charge exclusively as long as the moral support of the people allowed them um and and imagine just going at war like that, right? It's not that there weren't kind of heroic fits in a you know neutral sense by the by the Nazi troops. It's kind of sadly um, paradoxical that some of you know the finest um, you know elements, like also the uh, the Piper one that is the most successful the battle of the Ardennes, were also the ones that carried out systematic. Um, massacres of prisoners of civilians um, so crimes against humanity uh, because by the way they were losing and that's what, what happens when you start realizing that you're a failure that you lose control of yourself and that's definitely not a traditional uh, uh, you know feat that actually means that you are you are the lesser one um, so as you understand um, from from the allied side you understand there was a completely different feeling it's the feeling uh, it's the confidence, right, of an imminent victory. And this was properly felt, documented extensively among the Allied generals uh, in, in September, right? The problem, though, is that in October, so uh, at the end of September, Market Garden had finished, you know, uh, was fought between 17, the 17th and the 25th. Um, this situation had... Uh, if you want completely reversed, and this is, as you know, more very important in, in warfare because uh, at that point it's a matter of who's the morally strong one that can essentially push the other back and so on. And and indeed, uh, the semi-defeat of the Market Garden operation um, had spread um, among the Anglo-Americans the, the sense that, of course, especially the cost of pushing further into that point the, the, the choice was about entering Germany right and so breaking the Siegfried line and with enormous problems because at this point all the problems that the Wehrmacht had had uh, in the previous years that is you know essentially operating but with uh, very stretched um, supply lines especially in the east but just as as the, the more they the, the more distant they went from Germany were being reduced Right, in spite of the fact that the Allies had gained air superiority, um, and the the Luftwaffe was basically reduced to to very a uh, poor state, uh, not even the systematic bombardments of Germany at that point were so um, so powerful to impact, for example, logistics in that regard. This would help the the Germans during their then, right? And the air was already spotted by the Allies as the the training ground, where were also the um, say an air, in fact, that could conceal even, as we will see now, the the understand the the, the same the, the same intentions of the Germans that were, at least by the majority of the Allied command, not carried out a, uh, in fact, the, the massive offensive that the then won where it was right at this point. The Anglo-American troops had managed to reach the offshoots of the defenses of the Reich the so-called Western Wall, right? And so also from a tactical point of view, the, the picture had drastically changed. After months of fighting, 
consider this, the Allies were exhausted, right? The supply lines dangerously stretched, the reserves of men, equipment and ammo reduced to a minimum, at least in, in the front lines, because again, the, the advance had been very swift, especially through France. Um, there had been important battles, as you know, and losses, but the Germans had basically been wiped out um, from there. And at the at the moment, of course, the, the huge issues were logistical, right? Recruiting new troops, sending them, supplying them. As we've seen, the, the ports were, um, you know, a very important infrastructural issue. As the Axis had learned in North Africa in the same way. Um, and it, th there should be actually a, you know, an interesting perspective on on the fact that the especially the British troops that were fighting um, uh, at, uh, at this point were led by officers, the, the same officers that had suffered thirst and hunger um, during World War I when, hav after having crossed no man's land, that differently from what is usually shown in movies, is an incredibly boring and fortunately, you know, silent and really peaceful um, um, moment, right? They had to cross kilometers through sometimes through through in fact uh, areas that were very you know that they were damaged filled with um uh you know with 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 mud with it, it was not really uh, anywhere where there could be a an easy passage let's say and and bringing the supplies in to sustain eventually the fight that they would have had to carry it out once reached the enemy trenches was incredibly difficult. So the British, especially during World War I, notoriously had had this almost obsession, uh, mechanical reflex, let's say, of um, spending an enormous amount in logistical preparations. They wouldn't send their troops uh, out easily um, that way. And in part, of course, the, the Americans had monopolized uh, just by numbers, the, the process, and they had managed things in, in a bit of a different way. It was just, you know, strategically sensible, but of course, um, there are some logistical issues that at some point present themselves, even though the enemy is retreating, and you should keep pressuring them uh, accordingly, as much as you can, as, uh, as much as, in fact, logistics supports you. Um, and at that point, of course, uh, German resistance, however, had uh, strength had become more stubborn as it was now perched on that well fortified line uh, of the of of the western wall that it had proved um insurmountable so far with in 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 the netherlands etc and and some in fact also the better troops were now in the fight differently from you know what overall had been the, the the ones, the, the Nazi ones in, in France. Now, the determination of the Allies obviously remained solid because they were winning the war, right? But it just, it, it's a gigantic effort, even operationally speaking. So these poses we have seen commenting on the, the on war, how, you know, the, every war is, is fought essentially with important lacks of combat. You don't fight all the time in words that are just huge poses and then some combat um, and this rhythm naturally tends to 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 exhaust you to to lazy you especially when you have a, an advantage and so you can say well wait a minute let let me regain strength and then i will go and that that very often also makes you lose um, an important amount of resources which is actually going to cause more damage on you because you're going to give the enemy it doesn't matter whether losing on the broader um, spectrum, but still, you know, more time to prepare. Uh, this sense the fact that the Cold War had de facto already broken out, uh, and there was a race uh, towards Berlin that the, the two sides of, of, of the Allies were uh, were, were enacting uh, pushed the uh, the Western ones to also you know, uh, increase their 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 advance and they had all the reasons for that uh, the war was felt as costly in general so making it as short as possible uh, the the obvious uh, motivational factor to, to push things uh, hard um, and at this point actually also the the, the men and materiel was being brought in so there was even a greater force 
towards the offensive in absolute terms. It was a, a different view, as we will see now, between the, the Americans and the British regarding the, respectively, the, the broad and the narrow front strategy, and objectively, the Americans were, were right. And that's what was carried out by Eisenhower. Uh, and uh, th there is no way like a narrow front offensive, like like a rush towards Berlin, pa cutting through the Nazis, but exposing, like as it would happen actually for the same Nazis during the Ardennes, their flanks to to enemy counter enemy counter offensive from you know essentially a battle hardened uh, Wehrmacht. Yes, that was losing men, it had lost basically the majority, but still had very you know good uh, combat units standing and you know proving that during the Ardennes would have been disastrous it was nothing properly at the time also in historical retrospection that would have you know it was actually suggesting that the narrow front strategy would have been better right and this is in fact the point that interested Hitler because um, this uh, especially market garden uh, as a set, as an allied setback had brought back old feelings and antagonisms between the british and the uh, and, and and the americans consider that you know one century before the british had you know just burned down the american part <laughs> by the way so uh, those are things that uh, we may at least as children of well of in our case, at least children of boomers, etc., seeing the, the West as a as a solid block, etc. But it, you know, by 1944, there was also more recent history that somehow there was um, a British Empire still that didn't want to die in many ways, and the Americans taking over the world and having legitimate concerns, also divergencies, cultured towards attitudes uh, towards the also the barriers towards the same Nazis towards uh, the same Soviets right so all issues that today we do not discuss but it there is this also behind um, this rivalries as much as you know more kind of uh, trivial reason the British Marshal Bernard Montgomery the one who had defeated Rommel at El Alamein spared no public criticism on the strategic conduct of operations by the commander-in-chief, the American Dwight Eisenhower. Because, yes, you carried out the single most successful military operation in the history of mankind, uh, but, of course, that doesn't come by, you know, just a, a polishing work. You have to actually win the war in many ways. Uh, of course, there are issues you can't point out. But what Montgomery was actually hoping was to replace him in the supreme position, which also Churchill thought, like, what the hell? In fact, there are very interesting political um, subtleties here. To get at some point Churchill, after, as we will see, controversies that had arisen, especially after the Battle of Dierdan, Montgomery's speech that was basically, you know, um, a bit belittling the merit of the Americans, uh, overall, in favor naturally of his own, said uh, in front of of the uh, of the parliament that the the, the Ardent one had been a, a purely American victory, mm -hmm. and Churchill was a very clever man. Um, now, it was um, an unfeasible ambition for Montgomery, of course, to to become commander in chief of the Western Front, given that, of course, the Americans fielded more than double the forces of the Commonwealth. Uh, but did this not uh, extinguish Montgomery's acrimony, which helped to poison the climate in the Allied General Staff um, at a critical moment? And the Nazis knew, thanks to their intelligence, that disagreements and jealousies between British and American commanders became radical, right? Um, the uh, the former supported the need to attack the Rhine Wall towards the north in the Ruhr region, the, the largest industrial um, complex and kind of cutting more straight again to, towards Berlin. The latter opposed it because this would have meant placing the huge American forces operating uh, in southern France as a consequence under Montgomery's command to use them against the, the German um, region. 
of desire instead. Um, Eisenhower resorted, as was his habit, to, to a compromise solution because he was a very practical man, as you understand it, that would be two offenses, fundamentally. One in the north and one in the south. Um, and the, the fact that the Allied armies would be divided by the Ardennes region, in this sense, did not cause particular concern because um, this wooded rugged terrain the uh, at least people say the absence of roads, but it's not true really. Right, the, the main problem in the Ardennes was the, the lack of broader resources. Right, the roads might have not been optimal, but th there were plenty of. Right, the, the problem is what you have all around. <laughs> that is the actual issue. In fact, the wilderness, uh, the wilderness, and this w was certainly not the most suitable place for military operations in a big way from from the German side. Um, so the idea again is that in in the north the British would have more kind of autonomy, and um, in the, in their then and south the, the Americans were fully more, more fully invested, um, and mm, you 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 would think knowing World War II that uh, it was precisely through the Ardennes that in 1940 the Wehrmacht had conducted uh, its triumphant blitzkrieg against France. Um, so now the situation seemed completely different, um, however, right? And in, in this sense they were right, not that in fact the, the Germans couldn't succeed even this time, at least you know it's highly unlikely but we will see this now, but say the punch was delivered, right, and Allies' losses were high, so still, it, it was not a disaster, this is also what Eisenhower, while the, the, the offensive was still uh, uh, happening, made abundantly clear, because, and it was, you know, a, an absolutely accurate strategic assessment, um, but it's, um, it is also true that the 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 area was was to be garrisoned with that somehow weak veil of troops, right? Um, to ensure links between the two scheduled offensive actions, you you had, of course, to 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 deploy troops in the area, but it, it was objectively not so. Um, uh, say not that um, enormous concern apparently before, before the offensive, which was decided, and as we will see the same German high command, if it had depended at that point on them, they would have never carried out Hitler's uh, plans. Um, so, in that preliminary stage, at least, the Allied strategic posture was, was understandable, at least. Uh, and there were many considerations regarding this. For, first of all, mechanized warfare during World War II had increased dramatically, right? It, it was somehow easier to make the 1940 German army pass through the Ardennes, despite it was, a, even there, a huge gamble. And, and definitely not something you would just do by saying, oh my god, this is... The, the, ge the genius point of it all. M most of this, as you know, the, especially the 1940-1939 victories were hi due to Hitler's gamble, right? The fact that it was, it was such uh, uh, a bold idea that just the, the majority of the command would, would deem it to be excessive in that regard. The early Nazi victories in Europe were instead scored like that. Right, even the invasion of France was not it was clamorous in the sense in the way France crumbled. But you know, if you look at also from the German side, it you know they suffered important losses. Right, it, it, it wasn't like that uh, absolute success. It was ju even there the good enough of an army that was trying there to seize essentially the France per se as its industrial power, without which they would have never been able to invade the Soviet Union, etc. So it was all functional to that bigger scheme. But um, it was all so uh, very always beyond. This, this is characteristic of the German strategic culture, as you can see from, I don't know, the Schlieffen plan to the, the same Operation Barbarossa. Uh, always making a longer step than you can afford. Right, and then 
you know, dealing with the consequences. The, the, there are important strategic principles behind this behavior, but it, it's as if the Germans always gambled too far, right? To an extent that eventually, and like the entire world wars per se, were evidently somehow subject to to enormous unpredictable factors, and so the in that sense the the responsibility of the leadership, especially once the failure was accomplished, was dramatically responsible, right? And so you can see how this country preferred to have itself butchered uh, rather than at that point kind of admitting that they had been wrong. Uh, also, from a military point of view, let living ideology aside. Um, and But the, the main point though also that was not where uh, worrying the uh, for which the allies were not particularly worried is that the Wehrmacht although being still a formidable war machine by the end of 1944 was no longer of course that of the previous years the Nazis reached their top in terms of military quality in 1942 a bit like all the um, especially that this is valid also for for Italy for at least all those who, who had to compensate those, um, in fact, uh, uh, those gaps with the, since the beginning of the war, the war had boosted dramatically. Uh, a, a war effort that nobody thought could be so to, to, to be carried out so en energically by the bef before the war uh, broke out, and so all the the pressure arriving from the external began, right? Um, but the, the main problem of the Wehrmacht was mostly the very high losses it had suffered. Again, the main front was definitely the eastern one. Uh, and the, the the sheer amount of men that were swallowed there was was incredible. You know, if you look at a demographic chart like say of um of German males and females uh in during the twentieth century, basically re you realize that the generation nineteen hundred, nineteen twenty in in the male branch was literally wiped out. I mean, those are literally all the Germans who were killed in the war. You can't physically see that. Um, and the, the at this point, uh, Germany was probably running out of resources. Their enforcements were too young or too old, because that's also what, what, what could happen. And their training was, to say the least, summer. You need a good time for that. You don't just throw men after a couple of weeks of training. Um, into the meat grinder and thinking that, that they are a, an effective combat force. The doors are just going to be butchered like animals, right? Um, so the younger officers that were also the ones that had to make the thing work were inexperienced. At an important point, like the war here had been going on for, for years and uh, the Allies had uh, lost proportionally way less uh, troops uh, and the uh, I'm talking about the Western ones, and also, but also the Eastern ones. To say had so so many and uh, fighting all uh, at a time that there, there were experienced um, caters and and troops and so on. So there was no shortage of of that. Let's put it in this way. Um, the the Germans had uh, you know, an important proportion of veterans, but they were war weary. Right, this is what uh, was also found out exactly after those moments they, they by the Allies. The studies were carried out, I think, in in Britain, in um, in in the U.S. after the war, where when before uh, Overlord, uh, there were some veterans of of Africa, of Italy, and so on that were thought to be oh my God, those are veterans. They have an experience, right? So they were sent in France and they underperformed because it turns out. That Basically, in, in your lifetime, like you, you can't uh, psychophysically sustain more than 40 days of combat and being essentially functional for more fighting later, right? So at that point, you become an instructor or something so that you can, at that point, instead being very, very useful, for that matter. Um, uh, so in many ways, uh, these veterans were exhausted themselves on the German side, they were pretty 
well aware of the ined uh, inadequacy of the men under their command, this row records uh, records like children, like old people, and so on. Um, so in at at that point, as we were saying at the beginning, uh, the Nazis were kind of collectively aware of, of that defeat was coming and were scared, right? So this this enormous pressure, especially exerted by the enemies at the gates, uh, couldn't properly even be concealed, right? In the uh, not just because Germany was being bombed uh, regularly now and everything was thickening, but just you know families for what they could know uh, uh, their men at the front knew what, what was going on right so in part operationally what, what the enemy was uh, you know and they were evidently being su surrounded um, in the west in the east um, so the psychological stress of this military situation with no other predictable outcome than the destruction of Germany is definitely not going to make you feel that um, that better, you know that Hitler had escaped the uh, July 1944 coup. There had uh, an assassination attempt, not the only one he underwent, but say the one that came the closest to, and th there was a further entrenching of the dictator in his kind of ivory towers. The the SS had been provided with ever greater control, also of the military operations. Um, so, again, the after the Do You Want Total War speech in 1943, the, the situation had taken that kind of sense of non-return. But the, the, the reason why the Germans kept on fighting is that, as we were saying before, these people were literally believing that they were the right side, right? They were the good ones, and that they had to fight for the fatherland because those then communists and, and Jews at the same time were the were had the ultimate goal of erasing the, the master race that had the right to dominate the world and to exterminate them in turn. So that that was the actual belief. Right? And it's not again you, you can't say, well but you know, Germans were trained to obey uh, this is first of all not true, right? Germans are in that sense if, if, even if that were true, that doesn't mean that it to be a positive thing that eventually doesn't bring to critical situations because as far as adaptability to crisis um, a system that is just habituated to blindly obey is also a dramatically inefficient one because it cannot cope with the um, unforeseen right um, and the um, at the same time again you do know that that's the point I mean the the, the general feeling in the Wehrmacht is at this point historically very well documented. I mean, the, the anti-Semitism was everywhere. Everybody essentially believed in that. So they could have, they could be ignorant, they could be misled, they could be uh, brainwashed, wh whatever, but that's still something that a human being undergoes with the with an autonomous conscience that never abandons him and that therefore knows that, that, that this kind of a thing. It's more accurate to depict the situation like you know you have screwed up badly and that now you're going to pay the full consequences of it so you're basically shitting in your pants right and that's exactly what also brings to some sort of okay let's let's be committed to this offensive because it's kind of our, our last resort and there is much of this also in the uh, of, of, of this evidence in the in the command plan of operations where Again, today we cannot descend in the details, but there were several other, say, secondary operations carried out. As you know, the Stöße operation with the Fallschirmjäger, etc. That was just, you know, you have to seize control of Malmedy and then just, they turned it into a reconnaissance one. Because uh, this, as we'll see now, that this entire, the, the entire turn offensive was carried out in this very, very swiftly in a way. But w in this sense, with very few time for preparing. And the, the Stöße operation, for example, had been given like a chance of su success of one um, out of ten. Just but, you know, you have to do it anyway, and so you have to send the, the troops in fundamentally with that awareness. Because, again, also as military men, they can, you know, uh, as they are briefed, they, they can understand whether that's, you know, that's, just, that's a, a desperate thing or not. Not that let's say the, 
the mere life risk is is the point we're talking about the the success of the operation per se right also the 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 allied airborne troops you know on, on d-day were told like they had a survival rate of i don't know how like something like that like eight percent but at least it was part of a broader thing that that not only was supposed to but did work right and this this was a completely different thing i mean sending your troops to 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 annihilation by some degree is always complicated uh, again we will talk more about the the chances that the offensive really had in this regard um and what it could achieve but uh, overall the the consensus of, of of the same Wehrmacht at the time was that basically was impossible right now already in september hitler had presented his next move to the senior Wehrmacht officers perhaps the most risky of his long career as a reckless player uh, hitler explained that an offensive against the red army even if it had succeeded in destroying i don't know um 30 soviet d divisions would have had of mo no meaning because the, the the soviets had hundreds of them so it would have been just trying to empty the sea with a bucket um and they would have been wasted a, a much greater blow was possible against the anglo-americans right and the the Führer was convinced that relations between the allies were in fact on the verge of a crisis and that a well-aimed blow could shatter them reversing the course of the war on the western front and forcing in fact the british and um, the americans into a separate peace now if you analyze it in a logical sense uh, it, it it it's uh, it's correct right the if you manage to to blow out with this a uh, very uh, successful as surgical operation with this limited forces that do have uh, the um, the allies out of out of france well at that point it will be very complicated for the british and the americans to just recover morally from the blow let's leave aside the the enormous cost and bath of blood it would have required to, to carry out a second overlord and etc but this this moral blow may have also kind of uh, stopped the russians this is also quite unlikely per se um and um the, the hitler had in time uh, had had in mind all, all, all a lot of you know you know say uh, as you know secret weapons development uh programs to enact against the soviets so all in his mind this would have had to happen in time before the the soviets could be um uh, could, could arrive to in fact could enter could conquer germany because this so before the then the the nazis were awaiting for the soviet winter offensive that would have basically have to push uh, from from the Vistula to the order and so into germany uh, but there was not the practical time of course again had everything gone in the best major mode way let's assume even the, the Ardennes offensive had succeeded in you know making the entire western front collapse and the germans to regain control of france whatever it's unlikely that uh, even there would have been enough time and resources to say stop successfully the soviets right the soviets at that point may the the it would have been mostly like a political idea what would have stalin thought at that point um that is kind of unpredictable all this makes sense but it's just not a, a rational assessment on the base of the the situation it might be literally the last thing you you can try but hitler was kind of convinced that this was still you know much more easily or practically feasible than basically what the entire situation would would really reveal um considered now that um, the allies would have still somehow kept a very hard pressure on germany on, on so many sides right the the germans had lost the romanian oil fields they were suffering as they would during their then offensive of massive fuel shortage the point is that they literally uh, were were 
sent to attack but with an objective that was out of their few um, possibilities and so a lot of the, uh, the 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 problem had to be fixed as it would even happen in fact during the successful advance by seizing the 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 America the yes mostly like the Allies um, fuel depots and so on and going on with those but it's just that, that gives you a scale of, of the lack properly of means we're not talking about of men right um, the, the 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 punching units were there some of the best armored f armored forces have remained uh, were were employed but let's say even the the amount of troops that eventually you need to to use as a, a backup to to maintain position and so on were running out and they they were uh, as in fact that they had a very few armor proportion compared to the infantry so everything is extremely complicated because that that turns just into a, a meat grinder in any way it goes so again fanatism surely was not alien to even the the youngest um, German records the Hitler Jugend made uh, an important part of the a Nazi Ardennes offensive organic um, and um, and there would be in fact a, a good performance overall but just the the entire strategic and logistical situation were was pretty dire in, in the first place so the decision to go to go all out in the West of course as we've seen came from the awareness that the Soviets were at the moment unbeatable right without recovering major Western European assets right it's just like with Barbarossa as we we're saying before like Germany alone without the French or the Italian industrial capacity would have never even had properly the, the capacity to invade the Soviet Union it, w it was just impossible right so the, the entire system had to be put together and as we have seen it, that wouldn't be enough right and uh, basically Germany lost due to the fact that they literally miscalculated even properly the, the number of Soviet divisions we know it from from the general's correspondence from the Eastern Front literally said here they told us that they were I don't know just like tens of divisions less than what the ones we're finding now I, and in Germany of course in the country among the people the situation on the Eastern Front arose particular concern because also of the um, of properly of Nazi uh, I, uh, racial su su supremacist ideology I mean the, the Soviets were considered literally as uh, animals right instead as you know the same Hitler some kind of say love hate relations with with the English people so anybody was white he considered actually the the Soviets to be better fighters because they were even kind of more animal like than the Westerners that he deemed to be weakened because just they had to use also the you know the the black troops and so on so he had a, all an anthropological contempt towards the West in in that military sense but culturally and politically of course the Germans were much closer to to Britain to to the United States I mean how many German Americans were fighting in Europe whereas the Soviets were literally seen as the uh, the, the beasts of, of the steppes and by some civilizational degree of course uh, and we, we have proven it empirically what happened to, to Eastern Germany compared to Western Germany after the war you know some suspect you know would arise to say the least now um, Operation Bagration as we mentioned before this uh, Titanic uh, just by the scale of forces mobilized uh, operation carried out by the Soviets during the summer of 1944 w was a great also Stalin's victory uh, because this was the moment in which the the, the the Soviets actually were taking so many human casualties just people properly thrown away like uh, cannon fodder is just too expensive for how the Soviets considered human life individually and much of this is still reflected in today's Russian, you know, uh, you know, uh, existential awareness, and the um, and the Stavka was actually planning to take out Stalin, which was actually at the acme of his power. But the sheer amount of 
of massacred people thrown against you see the, the germans had almost wiped out the soviet union in attack you can imagine in defense notoriously the, the, the Nazis defended fanatically and the, the, the Soviets would just throw in people. You know, that, that, that's how it... Of course, it was a lot of operational effectiveness. The, the Soviets kind of topped that kind of good enough uh, level of also mechanized warfare, etc. Also thanks to the, to the land lease and massive Western uh, support, etc. But just the sheer amount of, of people thrown in and massacred, but still keeping to, to advance in the process um, had proven successful uh, and as a consequence uh, 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 a large part of the German army group center you know that the Eastern Front was divided in north center south was destroyed right so that was also the most important this had called, caused one million casualties and the front line was sh it was shifted west by 500 kilometers right soaked in blood but still closer to Berlin the Soviet offensive had ended not so much because the troops of the Red Army had suffered a similar number of losses compared to the enemy ones no at all but all um, above all because with their impetus advance they had exceeded the um, the limit of its rudimentary logistics system so it's not that the Soviets were concerned about finishing human beings. They were concerned about finishing, you know, the, how to make them going to their death, right? You know, with, with food and fuel. Um, and the, the stasis of the fighting, however, wouldn't last long. Already in November, the German high command could ascertain a reorganization of the Soviet forces in anticipation of a new winter offense. Uh, and... Once the Allies had been driven west with the Ardennes offensive, Hitler was confident that it would be possible to return to taking the initiative on the Eastern Front as well. That was kind of an unpious illusion. So, hence the ambitious objective of the Führer's plan, called Operation Wacht am Rhein. So the Rhine Sentinel, the Rhine Guard, that is a very famous and popular German national um, song that is about fact the, def the defense of, of the western borders of the fatherland in a you know lost in the in the mists of say of of the previous centuries also political uh, especially against France in a way but um, in in more in general uh, at that point against any uh, invader now this mm, operation consisted as we have understood in piercing the very thin lines of the first US army in the Ardennes between Belgium and Luxembourg with army group B right B led by Marshal Walter Modem that was one of the most competent commanders um, and this in order to carry out a circumventing maneuver that would have reached Brussels, Antwerp, that was the ultimate goal, tapping as many as four enemy armies, thus putting the whole Allied system in crisis. As we've seen, this overconfidence about the, the success of this operation derived from the fact that according to Hitler, um, mixed races were inferior. So Americans as a multi-ethnic people essentially matched that picture and the dictator was convinced that it would have been easy for the best troops of the Reich to overwhelm them right already by the end of the first day because the, the operation was to be carried out in a very few days actually right the schedule was very precise and this they had to be like a blitz Craig literally um, and uh, the interesting aspect of this is that everything was planned successfully because the Allies wouldn't basically realize this was, was about to happen. And after their paralyzation, there would have had to be the Nazi armored breakthrough in the Ardennes, right? The third stage was essentially reaching the Meuse between Liège and Dinant. And so Antwerp would have returned to German hands uh, as 
so would the western bank of the river Skelt, in, uh, ensuring uh, an important um, position for further advances, hopefully, having, say, in the process, wiped out uh, the bulk of, of the Western Allied forces. West, to accomplish the feat, Hitler thought he could make available about 30 excellent divisions, including two armored of the Waffen-SS, the first Leibstandarte SS out, out of Hitler, Division and the 12th Hitler Jugend 1. This was the plan, right? But the German general staff at this point, presented with the, with the plan, raised objections of very practical nature. So, as we've seen there, then were not the territory suitable for an operation in grand style. Where too many units would have lined up on communication routes more similar to mule tracks than roads. Um, and even if the inclement weather had left the powerful Allied Air Force grounded in, in late autumn, and basically the beginning of winter, a single brief clearing could make them regain control of the skies. Furthermore, the fuel reserves available to the Reich, as we've seen, were not able to maintain the required pace of movement, and, and, and supplies would have found it difficult to follow the programmed advance. So all this was definitely laid out um, on the table, also with the most painful wound represented by the organic, because at most about 20 divisions could be put together, including two of paratroopers who had never made a jump, by the way, uh, the, um, essentially the, the German reserves, Right, that also had were inexperienced. So they're talking about understaffed and full inexperienced units uh, with un unsufficiently trained soldiers. Um, in other words, the entire German plan had to rely on surprise, which would be achieved telling the truth, speed, which wasn't uh, in the execution, especially a lot of luck, which also, in many ways, you know, it was there, yes and no, let's say that at some point the, the Germans had the opportunity even to literally surround some American armies and wouldn't realize that, because also they were kind of blind, because their, their air force was really not there um, in the and uh, the weather was was terrifying so the uh, naturally this fast advance even when it was possible to be achieved in very limited sectors of the front uh, couldn't be fully exploited right and as we will see that the thing would essentially bog down right um, just by attrition and the shear also superiority of the Allied forces that capitalized on time to bring there in an incredibly speedy way with a, an enormous um, strategic and logistic mm, capacity at that point uh, a further 250,000 men um, within within a week right and so the Germans had overestimated their power uh, which is part of not ah, but they would have done it if the enemies were less well. As we will see, it's not just that right. They they could technically even make it right in the best imaginable scenario right to maybe to bog down later, not making absolutely the allies collapse altogether. On the contrary, maybe, but um, so much of the pattern. At some point there's a beautiful um, like with, with command. Reunited with, um, uh, you know, during the, the first days of the offensive, planning what to do, right? The, uh, the, the, there was a, a sense of dismay, like of sense that you know, they, they are, they have delivered us a heavy blow. Loss of our troops have been knocked out, etc. And I, th I think it was pattern. Yes, it said let let make the crowds arrive to Paris, and then let's butcher them down all along the way. Better, right? And that is kind of the mentality. Um, 
but uh, in fact what cannot be stressed enough is the degree of american resistance during this battle that is the, the thing that that really made it happen and again yes the the germans went close in, to to succeeding in a sense right not succeeding in in the in the broader say um you know plan of uh, kicking the, the the western allies out of europe but in delivering this massive blow that could have eventually led to some kind of further operations that would have had to be taken and not simply you know just the germans easily sweeping air all, all, all western europe from from the allies because that would have been definitely very very complicated with the forces available and surely actually making a you know it would have been terrifying because you see if the soviets had at that point just pushed further like if, if the germans had had spent all this further forces in the west um and um it's assumed that the western allies had not had the, the capacity of of uh, of pushing further you know the entire germany and it, maybe even france who knows right might have been occupied by the soviets and that the, the situation would have been dramatically complicated of course agreements had been carried out so it's not that stalin would have um simply just um okay let's continue indefinitely because also the, the red army was strained and there had been agreements regarding the share sharing of europe etc but in that moment right in the worst of scenarios um, the germans may have paradoxically condemned europe to a much and probably you know to, to a soviet hegemony on europe had this thing succeeded so actually a even more stupid idea next to the, the one of resisting to the death especially on the western front because on the east turn one you can at least understand it on the west really not in a broad but that's the point they, they thought they were the better ones so they preferred to take everybody down with them than saying okay let's think about the fact that we just uh, screwed up entirely and that we failed our own principle so these guys are kicking ass because they are superior to us let's at least at this point concentrate just on these this is in part what happened like you know the the advance in germany was pretty bloody but still nothing compared to the one coming from, uh, say from the east right where the germans literally fought to the death uh, pretty much uh, everywhere at least you know of course there were lots of prisoners and so on but it was just uh, you know much more intense resistance now in, in front of this plan model that again understood something about about strategy proposed an alternative a more modest and definitely rational plan so more achievable and let's say could bring perhaps to a more concrete result in in uh, say statistically as, as a gamble let's put it in this way um but uh, w which entailed essentially a narrower uh, front a more limited um objective and so on because nobody really thought that Antwerp could be reached right although the the marshal was among uh, by the way hitler's most trusted commanders the führer had now lost faith in the in the Wehrmacht, like in the, in the in the generals, he wouldn't any longer listen to them, especially since last summer, um, when, as we've seen, he had very luckily escaped from his perspective on July the twentieth to this bomb attack hatched against him by senior officers with Operation Valkyrie, um, and uh, Hitler embarked us on this path of total independence from what he considered like a case of cowards and traitors that is his best generals um, so from model's plan hitler took only actually the name uh, which replaced that uh, of wacht am rhein and now it was named as herbst nebel so the autumn fog which associated with the dense forests of, of the Ardennes recalled so this kind of Wagnerian landscape where it suggests it seemed auspicious for the veil of secrecy that was supposed to cover the preparation of the offensive was 
was known as you know the, the hunt in that regard so there was all this kind of ancestral mythological uh, kind of um, ideolo ideology of you know it's let's make let's attract them in this in the wolf uh, mouth in, in a way in our, on our own land or in our own sacred soil and all this kind of thing um, and let's systematically counterattack and, s and slaughter the hell out of them and um, it's interesting because you know just before the battle of the earth then the battle of the earth again forest had been fought well, so th there was that um a program of intense German resistance that we were talking about before in this forest and so this again the idea of a Germanic warrior that was defending his land from the invader and so on uh, that could boost also the spirit of this children fundamentally that could believe in fairy tales now from this point of view um, the Herbst Nebel operation was a success right the preparations were meticulous and attentive to the smallest detail. The capillary German telephone and telegraph network, which was very different from, from say, the one that existed in Eastern Europe or also in France for that matter, had made a necessary extensive use of radio transmissions, which the Allies intercepted and could decrypt thanks to the Ultra Machine. Naturally, further info was derived from the intelligence from from still of course the radio communications were kept being used but everything was much easier like uh, to transmit in the internal lines with much uh, greater political support in Germany etc and you know kind of the, the, the power base of, of the Reich and other communications traveled by relay as they had centuries before interestingly enough the units reached their starting positions at night to avoid being spotted by aerial reconnaissance they were provided apparently also uh, during the advance uh, with charcoal as opposed to fires would to to prevent uh, the the allies spotting their positions keeping them uh, concealed especially during the day uh, as we were saying before like in, in Central Europe things start getting pretty cold and also visibility um, given the weather was, was pretty pretty reduced so all this internal work helped dramatically because the surprise effect was achieved the roads were covered with straw to reduce the noise caused by the tracked vehicles so that even spies informers etc could not really tell uh, voices could not spread so of course in part the, the population was was kept unaware of this now the interesting aspect from the allied side is that some generals had actually understood that something was going on I mean either by broader strategic considerations or some hints that had grasped from from recent uh, info the some some elements of the high command had already been informed that uh, probably the Germans were carrying out something like because they they had obviously realized that troops had been unmasked behind the line but they didn't know whether like, they thought it was for a defensive purpose and this the, the Nazis had been good at for example um, transferring lots of uh, even properly making some ruses a lot of flack around Bonn uh, uh, around areas that would suggest rather a, a defensive concern right and posture that could somehow um, uh, in that sense distract the attention set from a possible offensive capacity and uh, these voices ran up high in the command but they were dismissed because they said you know where actually um, and nobody thought of their then because uh, again of the same considerations why the Wehrmacht thought it was a bad idea right so uh, in this sense the Allies should have learned better from Hitler's kind of uh, perpetual recklessness and gamble um, but at the same time the Germans paid for that choice um, as well now at half past five on December the 16th 1944 
the Germans unleashed the offensive, resulting in a total surprise. Right? This is interesting as much as the uh, the Germans too had suffered uh, the same the same fate due to the, for example, where the um, the Overlord landings would have occurred. Right, as you know, they thought essentially by Calais, and that's where the, the Atlantic Wall was strengthened. S someone had understood that Normandy would, was was better suited. In any case, war is a gamble; is the realm of uh, of danger. So you can't do anything, and especially the most successful uh, things, if you don't take that risk. And very often, there is a greater reward there. Um, so three armies, over 400,000 men strong in total, 1,200 armored vehicles and 4,200 artillery pieces moved in unison against the wicked manned defenses of the American troops. Naturally, you realize that because of bad weather and the general activity of the front that of course occurred recently, the Allies had um, had kind of struck properly the, the westernmost um, layers of, of the western wall, in fact. And so they initially thought that this was just like a lo uh, local retaliation, counterattack, something. They didn't realize the scale of, of the offensive. And, uh, you know, obviously it would be evident uh, in, in a while, in, in a short while. But that total surprise was really achieved and in their then the overall odds ratio that it were two to one in favor of the Nazis at the points of greatest pressure the Germans achieved even an over an overwhelming 10 to 1 so the Germanic tactic envisaged that the infantry would open the the engagement right acting as breaking troops as as you have seen they had essentially more um, infantry to throw in than than armor in in uh, in absolute in relative terms right so in, in importance so in other words this guys had to just be get butchered down this is again not different from the the logic that we use in the German, if, when describing the Germanic comitatus and so on, but that the youngest were s are sent in quasi suicidal um, uh, actions just to prove, to test their loyalty, their strength, the, their uh, their recklessness, because they're just biologically better designed for that, uh, you know, agility, uh, kind of craziness, and especially, you know fanatism in much greater things. There are, there are some things that in war you can uh, make a, an 18 year old do that, that a 30 year old would say wait 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 slow down a moment what I have to do like uh, that's the moment in which you can't th th those are the kind of brains that you can't s send more easily in the meat grinder right they're just kids right not that you know the average allied age was that higher but definitely now as we've seen the um, the, the Germans were scrapping the bottom of the barrel in terms of their demographic um, capacities. Um, so sending these troops in just without too much support was first of all a way to just to uh, make uh, recon reconnaissance, right, to save fuel in the process and wear and tear on, on the vehicles because at the end of the day the, the Americans were well equipped um, uh, and so, in a defensive position, they could they, they could easily take out uh, m more than what the Germans could afford in that moment to lose, uh, armored wise. Um, and um, the 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 vehicles, in fact, were instead destined to penetrate the enemy rear after having pinned it pinned it down. In fact, in, for example, the battle of Sa the battle of Saint Bit. The, uh, the Nazis performed like that, right? The, the Americans managed to stop the, the, the enemy infantry frontal attacks, but while their flanks began to degrade, they had to, to pull out. Uh, at the same Bastogne that we will see now, it, 
the 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 Germans attempted that, but they couldn't break in, as you know. Um, this was a way to uh, economize, right? But naturally, this flank maneuvers in that kind of terrain uh, were harder, and so also the effect in practice um, reduced. The Allied points of resistance were, in a sense, to be properly bypassed, where it was thought that if the, the moral effect of the surprise was, was that hard, like the and probably the punching physical one of, of the of the advance could could afford like the 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 the, the allies that were left behind in a sense by the, the German advance would have simply surrendered, uh, having realized to be like at that point t tens of kilometers behind the enemy lines now, without even having realized it. So. Um, there were naturally second line troops that were sent in as well, and these were also uh, infantry, right, just to uh, mop up in theory, but then to meet also an important resistance, as we will see. Uh, the Allies naturally paid dearly for their superficiality at the end of the day with which they had considered the strategic framework. Um, this is not to um, say stress maybe the say the military um, kind of more you know what's what's the point about the Western Allies during World War II is that they especially with the, with the, when the Americans came in there are enormous resources right some properly economical concerns that are um, that are that are ended in in some ways the Americans were full of equipment etc. And they were just attacking in mass with sheer firepower. As a consequence, when you look at the Nazis, they were kind of battle hardened and they were economizing dramatically. They, they somehow achieved a relative qualitative superiority. So the fact, for example, the German platoons still had kind of greater firepower than the uh, the, the American ones, for example, because still the MG42 that was, you know, like a hell of a of a hammering um, uh, weapon and uh, delivered uh, an enormous fire volume. Uh, the same average German soldier with K-98 would be set to, to fire more, you know, more more ac more more effectively, right? In in accuracy and precision and in in some point even speed, right? Because of sheer uh, uh, habit than uh, you know than, than an average American soldier with a semi-automatic M1 Garand or something like that was just shooting at you know not at random but let's say with this l less pressure uh, average but we're talking about average right because what actually instead the, the battle of the Ardennes showed is in spite of the fact again that the, the western allies was were carrying out this very large scale again broad front strategy that Eisenhower had in fact correctly from a military point of view carried out and successful in that sense we're of course paying for this local kind of more being thrown in uh, adapting to the situation just advancing no matter what and so at, at this point being caught somehow off guard especially in the Arden because the rest was still kind of you know pretty hard um, in fact, forces that the Germans themselves would have avoided. Um, the American resistance was was incredible in this battle, right? It showed again that these were just people. Some some of them were were just bro. They had never fought, right? Some regiments, divisions that had been sent into the front line. There were some. There also some veterans, some some fresher troops. But they showed a dedication, right? As we will see, especially the the nine the ninety ninth American division was next to the second one, which was more mm, battle hardened. But these guys are the ones who, again, inflict for one American casualty ninety to the Germans and basically win the battle of the Ardennes by holding the Elsenborn Ridge. Right, so the Americans had proven that already during World War the First. It could be very dedicated. They were a fresh, young nation, uh, still relatively, you know, compact, cohesive politically, also ethnically, and so on. It were actually the, the presence of, of 
black troops um, in the battle at the Battle of Jardin uh, is is very interesting. Uh, there were great acts of valor. There were also you know um, uh, they, they, they were victim of war crimes because the SS found them you know would torture them to death and this kind of things. Um, many of these uh, color troops had volunteered, by the way. Um, more than 700 died in, in, in the entire Western Front um, during the war, and there were much less than the, uh, say, the white uh, counterparts, but still it's, it's worth uh, looking at. It's also at Baston, they, they w there was an entire artillery regiment that was made up by, by, by blacks who, as you know, at Baston, famous episode of the entire battle but um, actually the Elsenborn one was more important but Bassan it was important actually too because it it made an uh, important part in fact of the the bulge you know the, the 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 bulge is the term that journalistically came about when on american newspapers they showed essentially the the shape of the the of of the salient that the germans had created right and so Bassan you you've seen it also in in the pictures it's on, on the southern and um, and it's just like a protrusion, it's just like another salient inside the German salient, right? And there was no way to, to break it. Uh, but most of, of the deal was in the north, right? That's really where the, the, the thing held dramatically well. Um, in any case, uh, again, the initial blow was pretty hard. Um, some American units were overwhelmed, utter panic, because the command posts had been suddenly attacked by German troops who penetrated deeply. Without being identified, there were, as you know, famously, Skorzeny, the same, the same kind of weird figure, was also a spy for, for the CIA during, af after the war. It was a great plan. It's the one that uh, kind of um, rescued slash kidnapped Mussolini in, in uh, reason. He, Hitler entrusted him all these kind of weird, um, impossible missions. Mo most of them are were were failures, telling the truth. But at least during the Battle of the Ardennes, uh, the Germans managed to to infiltrate, famously enough, some uh, some some troops dressed up like American troops. These were Germans who knew English very well, uh, and they could act uh, properly as uh, Allied troops. Um, some of them were actually uh, German Americans that, for some reason, before the war, had come back, for example, to Germany to fight for 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 Nazism, actually, which is also very interesting. So again, there were lots of, say, pretty typical American accents, even within uh, these troops, and who would carry out pretty you know sabotage essentially it would make very uh, even you know actually it would be successful at that world it caused confusion etc changing uh, signals uh, uh, on, on the roads um, of course carrying out other more concrete acts of sabotage and, and so on and, and that contributed dramatically well to the chaos so the that sense of you know we're lost right now, what the hell is going on? Where's the enemy? That was actually very supportive of the entire operation because the Germans managed to, to break through at several places and so many Allied units didn't, didn't know what the hell was going on again in the first place. Also, you can imagine with the communications of the time that were still somehow primitive after all in this, in this terrible weather and in a pretty thick environment with forests, mountains, rivers, and so on. As a consequence, in fact, chaos spread quickly like wildfire. And this was skillfully exploited by uh, the Germans. Uh, the 5th Panzer Army, led by Hasso von Manteuffel, was an expert in m mobile warfare, um, was one of the most successful during the Battle of the Ardennes, um, in, in the early stage of defense, the Germans took as many as 23,000 enemy prisoners. Sadly enough, as we will see, um, the Germans, especially when they began to start losing, began to kill these, as well as civilians. 
Um, there are very crude images in this video. I didn't say at the beginning, but you know, probably have already seen them. And you know, we are all adults here. Uh, are, you know, that just to show you the face of what I was telling you at the beginning. Like, you know, here we're not talking about video games heroes of uh, radically underschooled uh, third millennium kids who have played Call of Duty. These were talking about actual history, right? Women, children massacred. Uh, people tortured to death, uh, and more, right? On a scale that was sadly common, uh, not just among the SS, but notoriously among the, the Wehrmacht. Now, in, in other sectors of the front, um, there were individual units, although uh, isolated and without orders, that defended themselves strenuously. Because at the end of the day, um, that's also what you enter, uh, like in the, the military mindset. Like you are, you are first of all trained. Um, for many of them, these were some of the first uh, engagements, so there was a lot to prove. And loss for loss, it was better to fight to the death, because these damn crowds that, that the Allies hated. That's another thing that you don't have ever to forget that when. Um, that's another idiotic thing that stupid kids have been raised. Uh, I'm talking about also our generations, etc. Ah, uh, look, the soldiers were sent to war and they were just like common people. They look at each other, they were, uh, they didn't understand where their terrible leaders wanted them to fight and so they had no responsibility, poor dears. These people hated each other's Guts. Again, the Nazis thought they were the master race and that they were fighting against inferior people that they also thought they could torture to death, massacre, and eventually overrun and do against the same things that, you know, were being done just in time of, uh, of war, of course, uh, against them. Uh, and the, the Americans hated the Nazis, right? The, the myth of the chivalrous German that defends the fatherland is notoriously, and just, I... I presume that speaking largely to an American audience, you, per you perfectly know, I, I want to presume that you perfectly know your own history that was created after the war for very obvious political reasons that I also support. I mean, the fact that, of course, Germany and Europe in general had to be uh, won over um, against the, the Soviet threat. Um, the same thing was by condoning the, the Italians that also were so present uh, so, in such large numbers in the, the United States, in the same army, uh, there was an entire need to restore the lost honor of the Axis people to saying, yeah, it's just kind of the evil guys at the top, but the people is okay. Like, the, in this sense, we let get away some of the worst crimes that were car car carried out, some of the massacres that were carried out in at the Battle of the Ardennes. For example, the ones against the, the color troops were, were never punished, were never uh, never prosecuted, right? Th this is very interesting because it shows how much we have, like in the chaos of war, we have let, a, uh, let, let getting away with. Um, and these are all things that it means that there are people who, I mean, presumably, I mean, the, the German soldiers who did that were massacred in, in the remaining uh, months of the war. But surely there are people who survived that, they were responsible, and of course get away with that. And these have, are somebody's, grandparents, somebody's parents, grandparents, and they're probably, you know, uh, people that in order to carry out those things surely um, still thought, that this, as it was very common, for example, in 1950s Germany especially, to think that Hitler, after all, was a good person. Uh, that they were right and so on, and then, then you wonder why there is so much, uh, you know, lack of historical knowledge or intelligence of properly of European awareness of probably what is the, the, the superiority of Western civilization in the true traditional meaning of it, because these are, again, the national socialists that still live within us, right? And this is a pretty problematic issue, because not just these people existed, um, and here I don't save anyone, because there are countries in Europe that even were suffered the greatest brunt of the Holocaust, but also that were pretty anti-Semitic themselves, and that were, f for example, pick the French or the Poles, right, e equally. There has been this idea that they were somehow brave or, 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 or at least, um, you know, 
heroic in some of their stands, at least for the French, this is not done for reasons that are mostly intrinsic to the, again, the British, uh, let's say, some world views that are, but, but the Poles, for example, the Poles in 1939 could stop the Germans, contrarily to what is commonly said, they screwed up everything, they were also very anti-Semitic in nature, I'm not saying that they literally supported joyfully what, uh, you know, the, the Nazis carried out um, in, in their, uh, in, in the Polish ca concentration camps, but let's say we have to tell history for what it is, not for what you wish it to be. And again, here we're talking about peoples that of course hated each other and that was normal to hate, like, you know, Americans at the time, it's not they were strange subjects sent to fight uh, the good people and felt bad for it. Of course they hated German guts, right? Just stupid people today think that, I don't know, these Nazis are worth of prey, uh, or that, you know, I don't know, other peoples didn't fight to the death in the same ways that it was happening, because, you know, you don't have that stereotype that is basically the only thing you know about World War II from essentially, you know, subculture of the, you know, starting from the 60s and, and beyond, um, from, in, from journalists that is completely historically incompetent people or, you know, TV shows or movies or, or video games. Here we're talking actual history, what you have not ever been educated by anyone, nor by your, your country, your, your family, your school, whatever. Uh, you have not been raised, even in the best places in the world, in somewhere that has provided you with a satisfactory education. You don't have any. Let's be honest, if you are an average person, again, in the best Western countries, you're a gravely underschooled individual for what it takes to have a, an actual political, historical uh, education, or even a military one for that matter, which should be really part of the world, because otherwise you can't understand anything about what happened. Um, and you can easily see it would worse today. Like, it's obvious that countries that fight each other because they have done pretty evident wrongdoings that at the time are understood as such hate each other. Right, von Clausewitz teaches pretty clearly that you cannot essentially win wars if you don't, especially you can't attack, you can't invade, you can't conquer or put down if you don't top the trinity, which includes primordial hatred as one third of what is necessary to win a war. Right, so the, the sheer idiocy of people that of course eventually buy into conspiracy theories, in technologistic bias, in, 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 in racism, so in gross approximations that are purely anti-traditional because anti because tradition is much tougher than anything the Nazis even put stand. And with the only difference that, that is right, and the reason why the, the Nazis were weaker than tradition is that, of course, they were wrong. And tradition is much more brutal than you can ever imagine. It's not tolerant at all. It has nothing to do with leftism at all. It has nothing to do with being a dem Democrat or, or a Republican for that matter, right? But this is, again, what dumb kids believe. And unfortunately, these kids are people that eventually are going to live further in our world. And this is the terrible thing. And always remember this, that those who carried out stuff here in Europe back in the day, and I can tell you because, you know, my, you know, also in my family, we served pr pretty directly, you know, that. Um, and in my case, it would be interesting because I don't tell you in whose guard my grandfather uh, fought and w worked, rather. Uh, but we know the story, right? So, and we know what is the redemptive value of assessing this difference, right? And this is understanding the past and not condoning it, but not looking at it because you're obsessed of pointing the finger to say, the bad guy, but because you are able to discern right from wrong independently from anything that you have been told and not just reacting to what you have been told because basically nor who told you this nor you know anything about history, which is the standard approach that you see in today's minds, definitely. Now, um, so as we were saying before, the American uh, spirit there really proved much of what that traditional in fact morals and really really meant in, in, in that 
world was, was closer than today to the to the older Western values. Uh, banally, like weapons were distributed to cooks, drivers, um, administrative workers, transforming fundamentally every village and crossroad in the Ardennes into a fortress that had to be conquered with bladed attacks, right? You know, grains of sand, maybe, right? The, the, the Germans advanced consistently, but they found this resistance that was enough to jam the fragile mechanism of the German attack that in set in Hitler's mind was to be in inexorable, right? Because the Germans were the superior race and it couldn't be otherwise, right? The Germans instead gradually were worn out by a resistance again of a, essentially of of really what were in that situation strategically inferior forces but that stood because they were morally superior right and this is the incredible aspect of the story like of course there were some germans that were much more loaded than than other than some americans so i'm not generalizing and the germans also resisted with a brutal fanaticism that tells you how overloaded really they were but at the end of the day that mechanism was enough for long columns of um, vehicles clogging the snowy paths of the Ardennes waiting in the freezing cold with all technical difficulties also they had to keep every once in a while um, um, you know, like every 30 minutes they had to switch the, the engines on because otherwise the oil will literally congeal, right? Uh, with the with the engines running, by the way, also because especially from the German side, as you understand, they had to be fit for springing forward uh, at the right moment, right? So very often the hours pass in vain and also from a psychological point of view being kind of morally overloaded because this is the great operation that has to save Germany and all the fatherland is looking at you and it's, it's, it's a bogged down by things like you know you you are all adrenalinically loaded and, and you have to literally spend hours in the cold doing nothing essentially in a, in a car jam uh, is, 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 is is disruptive as you understand so obviously the thing in war is moral right when the expected outflanking of the enemy strongholds was, was carried out new traffic jams clogged the roads and paths right and then preventing the rapid advances foreseen in the program because um, again you had essentially the, the pincer movement so with three columns that had to eventually converge in the same place so you had to reorder everything as opposed to just going on the same track since the beginning in order equally um, there were some problems because literally the Germans themselves got lost at some point and some mm, roads that had to host just one column so another one entering in and so causing further problem um, the German troops had tracked vehicles that often lacked spare parts that's another problem the industry of the Reich was no longer able to replace the losses and uh, logistically we've seen what the different difficulties were so this meant that uh, repairing a damaged vehicle along the way was much more complicated than it had been in other operations uh, the resistance exerted by the allies on the flanks of the german offensive proved thus decisive right in particular to the north of the bulge on the elsenborn ridge were the second in the 99th uh, American divisions after hard fighting forced the sixth German one led by the Oberstgruppenführer of the Waffen SS Josef Dietrich to deviate on a more southern route changing the optimal advance uh, direction envisaged by the original plan again this is where the Germans suffered 90 times higher casualties than the Americans and um, 
this is being recognized also by, for example, there is an interesting work by the, the son of Eisenhower regarding this that makes pretty clear how the American resistance on Elsenborn Ridge made probably the entire front holding, right, in a broader perspective. Um, Dietrich, by the way, together with Pipa, were also um, persecuted during the Nürburgring trials because of the war crimes carried out during the, uh, the this this um, this operations. Um, so in practice, um, what you see first of all the the bulge, of course, the salient is the the place where literally the uh, the, the 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 Germans knocked out the strongest. Um, it was wanted, it was planned. Piper advanced very far, like uh, multiple tens of kilometers inland. But at that point, he had to pull back, even leaving prisoners and vehicles behind, because um, he had entered like just like a snake. Again, it's in theory what the British wanted the broader Allied strategy from their side to, to be like, right? And, and, and the the Americans basically just began to 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 uh, threaten. Uh, his um, uh, supply route, like you know, they could have even properly closed the the retreat to them. So everything was very complicated. Uh, this was the spearhead of the German army. It scored remarkable success, but eventually had was was stopped by the 82nd Airborne uh, Division. But to a point again, which they had basically remained alone. Again, they pulled out; there were just 800 men. Right, so it's somehow insignificant. It was just like the g most successful German unit, but still, to no, mm, to to a to an exceptional degree compared to to the average. In fact, also in the north and in the south, the other two German armies, respectively, engaged in the attack, found themselves to their great surprise blocked by the fierce resistance of the American troops. In, in the center, um, the 5th Army was stopped at the village of St. Bith, um, from which eventually Americans had to pull out, but still uh, slowing down significantly uh, the German advance. The schedule was not met. This is probably, if you want to measure mathematically, the failure of the operation since the beginning is, like, again, this thing had to be very fast right they had properly like on this day you have to be here on this day there everything had been be, being pre-planned and the thing began to, to slow down dramatically which means that also the cooperation between the various units was uh, was impossible right uh, in the south the seventh army remained nailed in the locality of Bastogne so there were the, there was no way to break through and were the famous Nazi answer was delivered to the German commander who asked for surrender. Baston is, is quite fascinating because basically for, for a long time it was also cut out, like it was properly surrounded entirely by the Germans. The Allied Air Force could drop supplies so to replenish uh, forces and the Germans were already measuring at that point the the fate of it. I mean, just like after one week, they understood that it was over, basically. And it was just like the, it took a while, took another month before the the Allies could retake the positions lost in the process. Because the Germans, by the way, at that point kept also, like the uh, Allies counter counterattacked in the, uh, and the Germans resisted in part on the positions that they had acquired. Um, the um, uh, so the, the Bastogne Nazis is just as you know basically nonsense it was just, just like the first thing the, the American commander said and that they said it to put it in as a response to the to the to the Germans in frustration the situation was pretty dramatic but that kind of embodies like it's just like bit like Cambron's war at Waterloo like you know we don't give a damn. Like we're we're going to get killed till the end, right? And that's how you burn the entire, um, you know, presumption of moral superiority of the enemy. And the reason why these localities are important because otherwise are small, but still that's how the the, the strategic 
case made them become what they were and the, the, the local resistance really made the name. Bassoni was also more publicized by war correspondents because they were more present there than, than, than in other parts. So that's why everybody knows Bastogne because it became the story, right? And he was, again, an important, militarily speaking, was an important um, position, but uh, not like Northern Ridge. Uh, and the road junction near the town of Bastogne was of, strate of vital strategic importance as well because um, uh, it basically its collapse could have also in that case widened dramatically the bulge southwards right um, and um, the the plan was frustrated there too and the delays suffered by the German advance altogether allowed the Americans to reinforce the position with the 101st Airborne Division sent for the occasion uh, in Bastogne by any means available because it had become a symbol almost of the of the resistance uh, in spite of properly the, the strategic relevance of the place right so said these guys must be relieved um, and they had been properly surrounded right differently from St. Beth uh, etc so it's like you properly don't leave anyone behind not just dead but obviously even more alive so without sufficient heavy weapons winter clothing and even food um, uh, the, the this mission uh, could be considered nearly suicidal uh, for the same airborne division by the way by December the 19th the position was isolated further the Germans sent the parliamentarians let's say to often the surrender and that's where general Anthony Mac Olive commander of the 101st became famous for his terse reply to the enemy envoys not right and and general Freiherr von Lutwitz that was the commander of the delegation had the American officers explain what the slang expression meant but he probably had uh, already guessed that his opponents would never lay down their arms Again, this is the, the the moral achievement of of so many Americans, also out, uh, not just in Bastogne, that uh, whose names we also kind of miss because also the the body count, as we will see, is, was was pretty painful. But th th there was a story behind all of these men, of course, as much as the ones from the other side, as you understand as well. Um, the German generals no longer had the tactical skill of the first years of the war and the reason being probably the degree of exhaustion of, uh, reached at that point. They hesitated, they missed more than one opportunity to take advantage of enemy weakness. In this sense the Americans risked f much more than you know the, what they achieved temporarily to 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 prevent right because uh, we're talking mostly about resistance, but at some point they could have simply been literally cut off from uh, from the rest uh, of the of the Allied forces to to a degree that would have broke on the longer run to a to a collapse. Um, and the Nazis um, distinguished themselves rather for their ruthlessness, committing massacres of prisoners, as we were saying, as in Bullingen. Uh, Bonnier and Malmedy. The American general Eisenhower, after an initial moment of bewilderment, saw an opportunity rather than a danger in the German offensive. He said, I want you, when he they all sat at the table, the high command said, I want you to smile. And you will smile this day because um, the leaving the fortifications on the Rhine, the Germans had essentially uncovered themselves and could be trapped by a decisive counterattack. So that's what uh, the high command was called to plan this response given that the, after all the front had held and so uh, the Germans were keeping to push at that point it was evident that things had not gone as they had planned in a broader sense but there was no time to lose um, 
and it was the incredible speed especially of the third army of the US General George Patton to make this 90 degrees change of front to head north and rush to the rescue of the encircled troops at Bastogne by the way um, w which were reached uh, on December 26 by the way um, but already uh, in the previous days weather conditions as we've seen had actually allowed uh, some some um, uh, air support uh, not just in in uh, supplies but literally in um, in firepower in destructive power the uh, bogged down German columns at that point were vulnerable exposed and so they started suffering heavy losses from the air where the Allies had definitely the superiority and Patton was asked like you know how quick can you uh, do that right you know how much time is going to take for for intervening and he immediately answered like I can bring in two divisions in 48 hours it was extremely fast in fact he went for it and uh, the immediately afterwards when Eisenhower asked him how much time would it take to start the operation the, the movement this had already began so pattern there was really you know um, uh, truly carrying out a blitzkrieg let's say and, and this shows how after the initial shock the Allies gradually regained control of the situation masterfully right the entire like the, the enormous effort of course they were advantaged in many ways over the Germans but uh, up to a certain point especially in, in that one um, and the um, uh, the 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 amount of men that was brought in uh, to uh, regain local superiority was uh, was was enormous and done in a very small time. Um, the influx of reinforcements reversed the balance of forces, uh, and the already painful German advance began to falter. To the north, Montgomery also took control of the American divisions, uh, cut off from their natural command and restored order to the troops. That's the much, uh, you know, uh, uh, discussed topic because that's uh, about it that Montgomery made a speech by saying, you know, I came there, I found, because Eisenhower was, again, pragmatic. He didn't like the man, but he realized that the Anglo-American solidarity was very important so in that sense Montgomery was uh, at some point also privileged by the commander-in-chief and uh, Montgomery said in his speech later that he had found like um, the American um, North uh, from their disorganized uh, he you know intervened in his own way and so on and he tried to basically make it sound as if he had arrived and solved the situation whereas it was actually the American generals that and also by the way that, you know considering that the American troops were overwhelmingly superior to, to the British ones even in that context the British ones definitely helped they also by the way they, they did hold their positions as well very well too against the Germans and also coping in uh, not much in, in the Ardennes but further north so when also some of th some tough units were were, were sent, um, etc. So chapeau to the British, telling the truth as well. But you know, just by by sheer proportion, we cannot talk about in the same way Montgomery really did. So much that he said that it was a mistake to have spoken that way, and probably would have not made that speech because. He said that the American generals would have, were so r resentful they, they wanted just to misunderstand him and so he would have better uh, r remain silent, right? So it was a very discussed um, event later, but this is just for, you know, uh, f uh, fueling, you know, Anglo-American feud, which actually, uh, you know, of course, di didn't prevail and we owe all so much to 
for what uh, the two countries achieved during World War II, independently and together. Now, uh, while the Wehrmacht tried to drive the Allies back in their den, by the way, the Siegfried defense uh, line behind uh, them weakened. This is an important aspect because, as I said before, the the um, the the battle dragged on for another month. Right, I, I, Hitler waited until January the eighth, nineteen forty-five, to admit the failure of the offensive, uh, and even allowed the return of the German survivors within the Western Wall. He kept them out, right, against the enemy. That, that's the kind of uh, you know degree by which he expected, of course, his troops just not to to never surrender in any case, right? Um, but this decision was um, pretty bad because uh, Hitler's ob uh, uh, say uh, obstination who for too long denied the failure of the operation ended up to aggravate the German position in the West. The Siegfried line was sensibly weakened because just uh, you had all these, th these troops could come back relatively um, in, in larger, much larger numbers. Uh, and uh, of course, it's normal in any operation to wait some time before, you know, you pull out your troops. Um, and the, um, uh, you have to, to wait for potential developments that are unpredictable. But Hitler properly couldn't tell Germany that this operation had failed. And he preferred in that sense to literally spend the entire force in his mind, like rather than making it come back for still defending better, say the Siegfried line. As we've seen properly, the offensive choice was preferred for a series of reasons, properly in German strategic culture that, that at that point had, as we were saying before, properly characterized their, their way of war. And again, everything is universal in a sense, but there, are s there is some bias that, um, even again, as we were saying before, it's not that the, the principle of the Ardennes offensive was wrong. It, it was militarily sensible. It's just the, you know, the the assessment of the forces and proportions involved that, you know, makes it very debatable on a. a say on a broader level. You can't just say, well, okay, it, it was bad because it failed, but at the same time there is a, uh, say, you, you, you don't just measure how many are the chances to win and just say, okay, let's, let's roll the dice. You have to understand what is at stake. Of course, for the Nazi regime, everything was at stake. So, as we were saying before, uh, probably a, a, a Nazi victory in their den would have actually mu been much worse for Europe, given the 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 the, in the gift that they would have uh, provided Stalin with to knock out the Western Allies further and essentially seizing much more of Germany than the Westerners could do. So this is just the, the degree of the stupidity. Of, of the national socialist regime and the reason again why also this by the way the, the, the Ardennes offensive slowed down the allied pace of operations of course maybe it would have been the same or even more if the Siegfried line would have been better defended this we, we don't know but in a way you can count how many inches of of German land were remaining, you know, um, for, for generations under the, the Soviets practically um, as a puppet regime just because, you know, there was no will to make the Western Allies enter Berlin, right, with a, with a good surrender, which is actually what was programmed uh, had, for example, the Valkyrie operation been carried out successfully and at that point it was much earlier and so it would have been a real sensible thing so yeah Hitler was an asshole in case you didn't notice 
um, and in fact, happily enough, on April the 30th, too late I would say, he killed himself and on May the 7th, Germany accepted surrender without conditions, right? Um, so it's not, of course, uh, what, what is fascinating, this, this period is, I don't know, the winter solstice, the, the last autumn of the Nazis, of this world that um, uh, was, um, in fact, um, devoured, alive, uh, after having controlled Europe for for some years in um, in the in, in a worldview, in fact, that um, we have escaped, but in, in this sense we have also forgotten, right? So surely there is something even romantic or heroic in the whole thing, except uh, for the for the wrong reason, and you can have that quite easily. And what it gets down to is the sheer ris irresponsibility, uh, bent degree also incompetence, and simply, um, you know, stupidity uh, of 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 Nazism. Um, so between the dead, missing, and wounded, the German losses were estimated at between sixty-seven thousand and two hundred and twenty five thousand men right for the Americans out of six hundred and ten thousand soldiers involved in battle the losses were eighty nine thousand of which uh, at least the first report said eighty five hundred dead right and um, actually there are other estimates that actually suggest that were perhaps even double in terms of uh, KIAs, um, and you can imagine, you know, given the numbers involved, essentially more than one million men in this battle, um, also how difficult it was to just, um, you know, count the bodies after all. Yes, you have tags, you have, but, you know, in the sheer, you know, difficulties that occurred. I mean, some bodies would be found even later on when just the ice melted at the end, let's say the, the snow melted at the end of winter and so on. Like, the... Um, you know, does it even matter? Like, of course it matters to the individuals, it matters, but it's just the overall results that we should contemplate as opposed to the body count per se. Not because that body count is not important again, but in a strictly um, strategic sense, um, this, uh, this, the, the, the failure of the Ardennes offensive opened to a phase in which the Germans did nothing but retreating till the end of the war, right? So uh, it's something that, again, in the nuts of Bastogne bodies something higher, more solemn, if you want, uh, than both for the again, for, for the entire situation, right, for both sides, really. Um, this was the largest and bloodiest battle, by the way, fought by the United States in the Second World War, right? Not in the Pacific, um, not in Africa, nor, you know, this in Europe, um, with, uh, because, as we've seen in the, uh, in the end, due to the, uh, to the surprise effect that really brought the uh, in the initial phases of, of the battle this uh, this large force caught uh, off guard and overwhelmed important part but also because of the resilience of the troops that stood their ground maybe they would have had less dead if they had surrendered but then they would have probably lost much more and many more other soldiers would have died uh, from their side later. So this is what it means to be a soldier and this is what it means to have a strategic education which after all uh, in those conditions would at least make you understand the ABC of it which uh, lots of people today just uh, uh, you know can like wish for right? uh, some abstract idea which they cannot draw any any boundary of. Uh, a lot could be said more about the Battle of the Ardennes and that's again why I would like to keep talking about World War II in general. Um, 
and again it's a uh, it's a very fascinating topic it's one of the most um, probably underrated I would say like everybody knows the, the name everybody knows the episodes even with uh, video games like um, kids come to know about it but knowing what it was just like for seeing what kind of weapons were used like let's make that example there is there is all an important um, air battle after uh, the first weeks uh, after the skies cleared the Germans began to bomb that they even killed with a V2 um, in Belgium like a, I think it was a theater they killed 500 civilians something like you know it, it's part of something that goes so far beyond um, that again um, uh, knowing how to recognize a place just because you fought um, a, a video game match in a kind of uh, reconstructed environment it is n has nothing to do of course with uh, caring for history I mean, I'm not saying understanding war knowing what war is um, of course because it would be too banal to say but you know appreciating really the meaning the meaning of war to core which is in fact often misunderstood like people think that war is bad and so they take this as an excuse to completely m misunderstand it and mishandle it uh, you must love war um, because war is, is beautiful even if it hurts um, even if it's terrible um, and there's no way around it it's written in our genes humans are attracted by danger and there's no way again around it so the entire point of course of the relation between politics and violence is uh, is after all a bit the meaning of our existence I made several videos about this so I will not uh, repeat myself but as you understand also through the um, let's say uh, political references that I made in this video to the say, of course to the also to the current situation uh, in the awareness regarding or lack there or of, of, of this um, of this episodes in, in 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 a history that is starting to be relatively far away and people in this sense maybe at least understandably forget by some degree especially the younger generations but that has a universal value that cannot be ignored nor measured on the base of how distant it really was so just think that the history of mankind is a bit like just in different scale all the wars you see here um, are really the same right er, that there is a battle of the Ardennes being fought right now uh, in not just because I don't know you may think of other um, you know just the most e obvious reference you can you could make of the war is being fought today but in, in general I mean even in your daily life even in in what you don't want to see as conflict because maybe it makes you feel bad about it or doesn't make you confront yourself with your own issues always know that for, for how much you can uh, understand because we're ever more distant from the reality of war as opposed to the the image of it which is largely fake um, that this man did it right all the men involved did it and you have to be able to understand there why they did it because at the end of the day that's what it truly gets down to right uh, war as a continuation of politics with other means um, for today however I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye